So what's the plan? What are we talking about? Uh, dependent arising, phrase of the Buddha, how to, how to loosen the grip of ego grasping. Oh, okay. And is there several talks on this one topic, or is this the only night? There are, there are two. Oh, okay, good. And who is going to be the umze and lead the prayers, lead the mandala offering? You're going to offer a mandala? No? Uh, yes, I'm usually the umze. Oh, okay. So then so we you... usually do about, for classes with Geshe-la, we do about 20 minutes of prayers. No, I'll do about uh, one minute. But we do prayers. something short. I'll do um, one minute of prayers. I think it's auspicious that the center offers a mandala, so you yep. can lead that, and then I can I can lead the refuge prayer. That's all we'll do. So okay. you lead the mandala. Sure. So Bob is going to sing the little, we all might know it. Maybe Bob's going to show it on the screen. I don't know. But what it is we're doing, we just think we're going to be offering all the things of the universe to the Buddha as a request for the teachings. That's the meaning of it, okay? And then I will lead the refuge prayer with the bodhicitta motivation after that. The um, the little short prayer somewhere. Where's the short one? The short, short, short mandala That's offering. The That's the one, okay. Yeah. So yeah. we'll imagine we're going to offer this, all the contents of the universe to request the teachings. That's the idea. Ah, So this prayer, we just think, um, what is that in English? You know, the first two lines is expressing our reliance on the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. And then the second two lines are stating our purpose for being together. The Lamas call it setting our motivation. So we're, so this is the most altruistic motivation. So we're basically thinking, you know, we're going to listen to these teachings so that we can become a Buddha, so we can be of benefit to sentient beings. Thinking this way, that's our motivation, you know. So that's one repetition. We'll do two more. In Sange, Chodan, Soke, Chognam, La, Janchu, Badu, Dagni, Kyapsu, Chi, Dagi, Chani, and Gipa, Sonam, Ki, Drola, Penche, Sange, Drupa, Shog, Sange, Chodan, Soke, Chognam, La, Janchu, Badu, Dagni, Kyapsu, Chi, Dagi, Chani, and Gipa, Sonam, Ki, Drola, Penche, Sange, Drupa, Shog. Okay, that's it. So, okay. So what's all this dependent arising mean? And how does it, how does understanding it loosen the grip of ego? And so in fact, if we could even ask the question, why should we want to lose the grip of ego, you know? So if we understand the Lam Rim, we know that these teachings about dependent arising as a, a logical reason for understanding emptiness comes right at the end of the path, basically the fifth and the sixth of the six perfections of the Bodhisattva. But I mean, as we if, if we understand the whole practice, 
you know, then actually what we're doing from the very beginning of practice, from the first stages of the Lam Rim, right at the beginning in the first scope, where we learn about karma, for example, we're already preparing our minds, you know. So, um, so what are we preparing our minds for? Well, basically the main point, essentially what Buddha is saying is that we all suffer. There is suffering existing, different levels of suffering, and, and the central reason is because we have in our minds layers upon layers upon layers, literally, of misconceptions about how things exist. So if we look in the middle scope, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna listen, we're gonna think we're gonna be we'll learn about attachment and aversion and arrogance and all the other delusions, the afflictions that are the, actually the main voice of ego. So they have the key component of being misconceptions, but that's not the only thing. I mean, in fact, if we look at the whole entire Buddhist view, you know, which is all expressed in the Lam Rim, it's basically Buddha, Buddhism being presented, Buddha presenting or the presentation of Buddha's, literally Buddha's views about how things exist. That's it. So what Buddhism is is this elaborate, coherent presentation of how things exist. So, um, so for example, we all, you know, we assume that religion means having belief in a creator. Buddha disagrees. He would say that's a misconception. We don't need creating, you know. Buddha's, I mean, the Western view, the materialist view says that our mind is the brain. Buddha says that's a misconception. Um, you know, we have all these, these, these delusions in the mind, attachment and aversion that have at their core a misconception about reality, but they also we, cause us so much suffering because of the emotional component, you know. But essentially, he's basically saying our minds are riddled with misconceptions about how things exist. So by studying Buddhism, essentially what you're doing, you're studying Buddha's take on the world. The very first level, the very essential point we learn, the essence of the first scope of the Lam Rim, is abiding by the laws of karma. I mean, this view of karma is absolutely huge in Buddhism. Many people who practice Buddhism, who like to do certain meditations, have no interest in karma, as if somehow it's an added thing that you can think about if you want to. I mean, the whole of Buddhism would collapse into a heap of incoherent nonsense if we didn't factor in karma. It's absolutely fundamental, you know, but not only as a view, but also understanding karma right at the beginning is a really good preparation for us to understand emptiness because it's the it's a brilliant example of the first level of dependent arising that I come into existence in dependence upon causes. And specifically, of course, for the Buddha, as opposed to the materialist view, which agrees that we come into existence in dependence upon causes, but they mean by that mother, father, grandma, grandpa, and so on and so forth. I mean, Buddha doesn't disagree that we come into existence in dependence upon mothers and fathers, but he makes this radical extra point that the main cause of me isn't my body, isn't my mother, isn't my father, is certainly not a being called a creator, no such concept for the Buddha, but it's my own past because our mind, which is not the brain, which come, does not begin in the mother's womb, it's this beginningless continuity of mental moments that's programmed every millisecond by whatever I think and do and say in that mind. That's the law of karma. Now, Buddha's, you know, our view of religion is very interesting. I think we tend to think it's a belief. It's the commonest view we have. And we certainly don't think you can prove things. I mean, and that's reasonable. If you posit a creator, then by definition, you can't prove that God is right, because if you prove God is right, that means you're also God, and you can't talk like that. Buddha's view is fundamentally different, and we need to look at these things very carefully if we like to study the Buddha's teachings. But the commonest mistake we make is we assume, oh, karma, reincarnation, this is a belief system, you know. I mean, Buddha would say that's total just ignorance. It's kind of intellectual laziness. It's a bizarre idea to think as a belief system. Buddha is like a scientist telling us precisely what he has observed with his own mind to be what is true. And then he presents it. He says, here are my findings. And if you want to also prove it yourself, here is my methodology. That's the approach in Buddhism, which, I mean, even as Buddhists, I think this somehow sometimes surprises us, you know. But this is the point. This is why Buddha is fundamentally different. 
in many ways from the Christian, from the teachings that posit a creator. And this is the point. The diff, this is the point where he diverges, you know. So, so Bhakama is Buddha's observation with his own direct mind, his own direct experience. He is, I mean, he, he wasn't the person who made it up. I mean, the Hindus before him first observed this. So Buddha doesn't disagree. This is what he has observed, that the consciousness is not physical, that minds go back and back and back into previous lifetimes, and that everything we think and do and say programs that mind and produces the person we become. That's essentially the law of karma, you know. This is And this is the law for the Buddha. This is the law that runs the universe. And because he didn't make it up, it's not speculating. He didn't have a vision of it. He's not kind of, you know, he doesn't run it. It's not punishment. It's not reward. Because there's no punisher or rewarder in Buddhism. There's no such concept as a creator. So this is what Buddha is telling us that he has found to be true. So then he says, so it sounds peculiar to us to think that we suffer. What I think is odd, we think, what do you mean I suffer because I because I believe in a creator? What do you mean I suffer if I believe my mind is the brain? We'll say, well, I'm allowed to believe what we like. Well, of course you are. We're allowed to do exactly what we like. But we all would understand the scientific approach which is that we're trying to find reality. And if you say one plus one is three, and I'm allowed to think that, well, you are allowed to think it, but it won't get you far. It won't help you. It's not reality. It's not conventional wisdom. So, you know, we're just talking in conventional wisdom. So conventional wisdom is that our mind is not physical. It is not the brain. It doesn't come from a creator. It doesn't come from mummy and daddy. It doesn't begin in the womb. It's got a beginningless continuity of mental moments that's programmed by whatever we do in that mind. And this is the Buddha's telling us this is reality. He's not asking us to believe a single word. So the point he's making is the cause of suffering is not being in touch with reality. Now, this is a very odd concept to us. We would never, ever think that we're not, that we, we suffer because we do, we're not in touch with reality. I mean, that just sounds too bizarre to us, but this is exactly what Buddha is saying. And it's a surprising way to put it because we don't think of it like this, you know. So the very first level of teachings is Buddha's telling us about karma. So, of course, the way it's taught by the Tibetans, because it's the assumption in that culture, they're not saying karma is correct. They're saying this is this is how you abide by the laws of karma. There's an assumption that we already accept the law of karma. So of course, for us modern people, we've got a bit of use a bit of logic to try and work out how why we would even want to abide by the laws of karma. You know, but Buddha is simply telling us the reason to abide by the laws of karma because karma is a natural law that runs the universe, and that negative actions, actions we do with our body and speech driven by delusions, so seeds in our mind that will ripen in the future as my suffering. And that and that um and that actions that are driven by my virtuous states of mind will necessarily ripen in the future as my happiness. But the extra component for us in the modern world is to even get our head around this concept in the first place, you know. And then also especially not to misinterpret it. In this, as being a similar teaching to the Christians, for example. I mean, it is very similar. Jesus has his little list of 10 don'ts. The Buddhism, Buddhism has a little list of 10 don'ts. Jesus says, don't kill. Buddha says, don't kill. We assume it's the same thing. Well, yes, it's the same, but the difference is the reason. This is a hugely important point if we want to practice the Buddha's teachings. You know, Jesus says, don't kill. Because God says you shouldn't kill. So the reason it's a sin in Christianity, and I, a, a priest told me this, is because God said, because God's the boss. I mean, but Buddha says don't kill, and it's not because he says so. That is a bizarre idea. Of course not. It's because people don't like getting killed. It's a natural law. It's a natural law. So this is a massive difference. And getting our head around the Buddha's teachings, being in touch with what he is suggesting is reality, is why we would study the teachings. And this is the why we would study the teachings is because we've decided, because we've listened to the Buddha's teachings, we've, but we've basically decided to buy into them. And in that process of studying it, you're not just blindly swallowing it whole, you are learning to understand it theoretically, to understand the logic of it. And then slowly that brings some kind of wisdom because even theoretically being in touch with reality is a good start, you know.
And then slowly, slowly, as we advance more and more, we start to directly realize the truth of karma. You know, when we get single point of concentration, when our mind is more subtle, we can then see the past and we can see the future and we can see the minds of others and we can prove it is true. All the methodologies there. All this is part of this process of learning to give up suffering and its causes, you know. And then the essence of the first scope of practice then is to abide by the laws of karma. And this helps us directly, actually helps us begin to understand emptiness because depending on rising is, as Lama Yeshi says, paraphrasing Tsongkhapa, it's a king of logics to prove emptiness. So karma is a brilliant example of the first level of dependent arising, which is that things that particularly I are the, am the product of causes. But specifically for the Buddha, the main causes are my past actions and my and my and my states of mind. So that's quite a unique view of the Buddhas, you know. So that's already loosening the because when we look at how we – that's the thing. When we look at how we think now, we don't – you see, people who are physical, philosophical materialists, they will say, oh, I don't believe in anything. They think religion is something you've made up that you believe in, but they don't believe in anything they'll say. Well, I mean, that's a complete joke. If you're a philosophical materialist, you believe your mind is the brain. You believe your mother and father made you. You believe that, you know, you didn't ask to get born. These are all belief systems. That's a belief system. And the Buddha would suggest it doesn't, it's not in touch with reality, which surprises the materialists, very shocked. So we all believe, we all, our head is full of ideas about what we think is true. And, and because the world all thinks it, I mean, if you're living in a Buddhist society like the Tibetans were, where 95, 97% were Buddhist, of course you take all the views for granted because everybody assumes it. And that's how it's like in the modern world. I mean, the prevailing view in the world is the scientific one, is the materialist one, you know. So we take it as a given. We take it as an absolute truth. We don't question it, not for a second. So Buddha is suggesting that's a good idea because he would suggest it's not true. He would say, and materialism, it's not as if it's the, it's the first time people come up with this view. It's one of the many schools of thought way back 2,000, 3,000 years ago, you know. So it's a view. So one other way to put all this is that our mind is full of viewpoints. All the emotional ones, anger, love, compassion, the, these are viewpoints, you know. The view of karma, the view of the brain, the view of mummy, daddy made me, the view of Buddhism, they're all viewpoints. It's a really interesting way to put it. And it happens to be, clearly, some of these viewpoints will indeed be in sync with reality, and then some won't be. So our job as Buddhists is to investigate all this and come up with what is true and what is not. That's exactly what the job is, you know. So Buddha is telling us the, the main reason there is suffering existing is because we have, there's two main causes. He tells us this in the Four Noble Truths. The first cause is the action that we have done in the past that is driven by the second cause and the two subsumed to the second one, that driven by a deluded state of mind, and a, a state of mind such as attachment, anger, jealousy, that is an emotional affliction that has, it, that has this main component of being a misconception, literally a misconception. So the misconceptions in our mind, whether they're the emotional ones like anger and attachment, or even finally ego grasping, the root delusion, or whether it's the view about karma, the view about emptiness, the view about the brain, the view about mother made me, the view about a creator, these, the Buddha would suggest these are misconceptions. So his bare bones point is not being in touch with reality is why we suffer. And it sounds odd to think this, but look at it. I think it's logical. You know, if you have a $50 note, but for so long you have totally believed that it's $500, when you look at it, $500 literally appears to your mind. So it is obvious that you thinking one thing, but the reality is something else. There's a big conflict there. So because you're going to go off and spend that $50, believing you're going to get $500 worth. And so what will happen? You'll be bitterly disappointed. You'll bump into reality. 
So it's a really weird thing to say, but this, it's really clear when we see it, you know. Buddha's telling us the extent to which we are, have these misconceptions in our mind is the extent to which we suffer. So then you think it sounds kind of rude of him. It sounds kind of like sectarian to say if you believe in a creator, you're going to suffer. So what's he mean by that? I mean, this is his view. He, he just, you know, all these, he, has, he was brought up in the Hindu tradition and then he diverged in his own direction, particularly in relation to the nature of self, which is this one of emptiness. And he would say that, you know, the view, I mean, the Hindus came up with different observations about reality and he, he agrees with many. They already discovered um, the, the, that they already discovered the methods that you can stop suffering of the lower realms. He didn't, Buddha didn't come up with that first, the Hindus did, they, which is the teachings of the first scope. He already, they already discovered how you can get rid of attachment. They even gave up that, but they didn't go all the way, he would suggest. They, did, they still posited a view of an essential I, an intrinsic I, and still have the view of an intrinsic energy called God that's the source of everything. So on the face of it, you think, well, don't be so rude. How can that be the cause of suffering? Simply because simply because believing in something that doesn't exist, eventually when you achieve the, the peak, the peak, the absolute peak of the view that they say is liberation, you just actually, you haven't achieved the peak. You haven't cut the ego at all. And eventually that karma will run out and you'll be back in the lower realms again. So it's literally is still the cause of suffering, even though initially it's the cause of some kind of bliss, you know, because it's not reality. It's a way of talking about it, which is very interesting. And it can sound very arrogant to us, like saying Buddha's telling everybody else they're wrong. Well, that's okay. Everyone's allowed to say somebody's wrong. You just got to give your views. That's what give your findings. And it's up to us then to prove it. Buddha's not trying to force us. He's not trying to make us believe all this stuff. He's telling us his own observations of what he has found to be true. It's a very interesting point. That's why belief is, I mean, I never use that word, you know. It's just it's just intellectual laziness. So okay, so then so then now being more specific, then how is the view of cause and effect, the view of karma, a really good example of dependent arising, and therefore really excellent way to help us loosen the grip of ego grasping, because. Dependent arising, this is what we now learn in the final scope, in the great scope, in the six perfections. Dependent arising. There are many logical reasons, Buddha says, for why things don't have an intrinsic nature. This is the final point he's trying to show. This is where he diverged from the Hindus. You know, They say there is an intrinsic nature. There is an intrinsic self. Similar to the Christian teachings about there being an intrinsic soul, similar to the teaching that there's a creator, it's a viewpoint, it's a philosophical position. So the Buddha is saying there can't be such an I, it's not a possibility, it's not viable. So one of the logical reasons to prove is this logic of karma. How I is the product a phenomenon called I, or for that matter, a phenomenon called a computer or a pen or any other phenomenon that exists, but we're discussing the phenomenon called I here. The phenomenon called I is empty of existing from its own side because it's the product of causes. I remember when I was first studied with my philosophy teacher, Geshe Tektrok, uh, who was our abbot at Nalanda Monastery in France for 10 years and then passed away many years ago. Uh, I studied first with him in England in the Geshe program, which was what Lama started in the late 70s as the precursor of the master's program and the Buddha, and the basic program. And I studied with Geshe Tektrok. But I remember in this discussion about dependent arising, he used the example of the phenomenon, the the object, the phenomenon called Rabina, which of course is why I remember it. And he said, everything in the universe up to the first second of Rabina is validly a cause and a condition for the existence of Rabina. So that sounds, sounds kind of mind-blowing, but the implication meaning everything up to the second is the cause of Rabina 
And the fact is, we won't, among any one of those causes, you will not find a Rabina because Rabina, a person, is the fruit of those causes. So this is the very first example. So how? So the question is then, how, by abiding by the laws of karma, how, by applying this logic of cause and effect in relation to oneself, how does that loosen the grip of ego grasping? It's really tasty, actually. You know, it's very, very, very helpful. Well, well let's look at it. So we analyze the view we already have, which, as I said before, we don't even think we have a view. You know, we just assume seem, things seem to be the way that we think they are. We don't analyze it. So look at how we feel emotionally when something goes wrong. You know, the first instinct is shock. How dare that happen to me, we'll say. I didn't do anything to deserve it, we will say. Or we have a general kind of a joke. I mean, excuse me, I didn't ask to get born. It's not my fault. So th this way we talk, this is a very powerful indication of the view in our mind already. I mean, you say those, whatever words you say indicate what you believe to be true. And it's a very strong feeling we have. Everybody recognizes it. How dare you do that to me? How dare that happen? Or you see someone else. How dare that happen to her? She doesn't deserve it. This is so inbuilt in our mind. So that, in other words, we have a philosophical view already of an intrinsic me that hasn't been caused or me meaning that I, that there's no causes that I have created that make that happen to me. There's no feeling of me being involved in it. We feel it all happens to us unfairly. I think everybody feels this. This is unpacking how ego works. This is why we suffer so badly. And that how dare that happen to me, that's called anger. That's what anger is. This shock, this outrage, even you, you know, even you stub your toe. The feeling is how dare that happen? I don't deserve it. Like how dare that happen? We curse it. It's a view of an innocent victim. It's a view that it happened and it shouldn't have happened. I don't deserve it. How dare that happen? It's the feeling of shock because we assume we shouldn't have suffering. There's a deep feeling in our bones that somehow we don't deserve suffering. Suffering shouldn't happen to me. I mean, we don't unpack it like this, but this is incredibly important. So our way of living our life emotionally is a literal evidence. It's evidence of what we think in our mind because emotions are just the, the experience that are and they're rooted in being conceptions. They're rooted in being conceptual thoughts. But that we don't notice those conceptual thoughts until they become emotional. You know, this is very powerful. And then, of course, when good things happen, it's even more subtle. When good things happen, because we assume. Only good things should ever happen. We absolutely have an assumption that we only deserve good things and we absolutely do not deserve bad things. I think this is this is a deeply held philosophical position in everybody's mind. And this is the exact source of just day-to-day -day suffering. So attachment is the cause of the first one, of the second one. Attachment is this default primordial assumption that only the good things should happen to me, G only good things. And, and because we, you know, we assume we, des we it's because we assume we only deserve good things. So when the good things happen, we don't question why did that happen? We just assume it's right. We assume that's just how it ought to be. In other words, we don't think we play any role in our lives. We really believe it. Analyze this. Look at this. We believe somehow happiness and suffering come from outside. 
that I was plonked on this planet by somebody else, that I didn't ask to get born, that I had no role in me becoming me, and that what happens is literally good luck and bad luck. I mean, this is how we live our life. And no wonder we suffer. Buddha says this is just total ignorance. We've been believing in these views, he says, for countless lifetimes to the point where they're totally absolute truths for us. So then he says reality isn't like that. And that's why we suffer because we keep bumping into the fact that reality isn't like that. So how do we, un so this is unpacking attachment and aversion, and it's quite hard to see this because they're so deeply ingrained, you know. So attachment is this constant kind of panic, panicked assumption that I must only have good experiences, that only the good things must happen. And there's kind of, it's kind of desperate. It's kind of frantic, you know. And then the shock and horror when bad things happen. And this is called attachment and anger, people. And we go between these a thousand times a day. So they're the main voices of ego grasping. They're the main voices of the root delusion called ego grasping that believes in the intrinsic, independent, separate, concrete me. And then we look at that directly at the end of the path when we look at dependent arising. But here already is such a good opportunity. By having the view of karma. So what is that saying? It's the exact opposite of the view of attachment and aversion. The Buddha is telling us that every millisecond of what we experience in daily life, the main cause of it is in my mind. I'm the main cause of it. This is the biggest shock we've ever heard. It's the exact opposite of what we think. But this is what Buddha says is reality, quite literally, that every single thing we see, hear, taste, touch, smell, think about, everything that happens to us every millisecond is the fruit of, of seeds I planted in my mind in the past based on the actions that I have done. Any experience that's called happiness or pleasant or nice is the fruit of an action I did that's labeled virtuous, which is was was a virtuous action, which is an action that was rooted in in a dilute in a virtue. So actions core driven by love, compassion, patience, etc., can only ripen as my happiness, either as one, a type of rebirth, two, a tendency to keep doing it, three, the experience of having it done to me, and four, an environmental result. This is the logic of karma. And every millisecond of our life, actions from the past, second by second, seeds are ripening every second as my happy experiences and my suffering experiences. So in fact, whatever happens to us has got everything to do with us, but we literally believe the exact opposite. So no wonder we suffer, Buddha says, because not being in touch with reality is why we suffer. The disconnect between believing a $50 note is a $500 note is, set you, is setting you up for suffering. So believing you're an innocent victim who didn't ask to get born is the, is absolutely setting you up for suffering. The reality is, Buddha says, the reality is the main cause of your type of rebirth is your past action. The main cause of each of the intent, each of the tendencies in your mind is your habit of practicing them before. The main cause of how people see you and treat you, whether they love you, hate you, kill you, rape you, give you money, take your money, believe you, not believe you, whatever it might be, second by second, the main cause of every one of those experiences is actions like that that you've done in the past. And the main cause of even the way the very physical environment impacts upon you. You know, kissing your grandmother, you get COVID and die. That's due to your past non-virtue of killing, such that the environment, your grandmother, causes you sickness, you know. Every single tiny thing we experience, every tiny thing that happens to us, every tiny thing that arises in our mind, for the Buddha, has everything to do with me. But we literally think it has nothing to do with me. I mean, it's like we're schizophrenic. 
Well, I mean, yes, you would say that, you know. And these are viewpoints we have in our mind, but we don't even think we have a viewpoint. We just think that the way the world appears to us is the way things exist. We don't even question. This is, and Buddha says, this is why we suffer. So applying the laws of karma, entry level, junior school, grade one in the first scope of the Lam Rim is a profound method of applying dependent arising in order to loosen the grip of the self-pity of ego. Because as you start to take responsibility, that that experience of someone giving me $1,000 as a gift isn't just some good luck. I must have created the cause of my past generosity. How incredible. Or if someone steals my of my $1,000, then you don't go shocking. You know that you caused this. You know it is the fruit of your past actions. So you then that radically changes your approach to it. This is what Buddha means by being in sync with reality as a basis for becoming happy i mean we might think of it like this but if you analyze it it's logical you know so abiding by the laws of karma which buddha says is a natural law it runs the universe no one made it up no one runs it it's not punishment it's not reward it's just the way things are and it's a profound level of practice before you get anywhere near even understanding your mind, learning to take responsibility for your experiences, learning to own the good and own the bad. This completely changes you and loosens the grip of the self-pity, loosens the grip of the ego, loosens the fear, loosens the suffering. There's no doubt about it. And this is just first scope, not even getting anywhere near the, the, the subtlest level of dependent arising yet, you know. So what do you think, people? It's me talking for 40 minutes nonstop. So now you can ask me some questions. Oh, Rubina, I yeah. have a question. Good. Mm -hmm. Who's I? Which is the person talking? Kevin. Who? Where are you? Hang on. I've got to find you first, Kevin. Where are you? Kevin, put your hand up. All sort of. Oh, there you go. Hang on, a tick, Kevin. Let me just get my tissues. I've got to blow my nose. Excuse me. Okay. Go on, Kevin. Talk to me. <laughs> so, I I think I understand the concept of there not being an inherent I. But oh, okay, if, good. If there is a a beginningless consciousness, is there an inherent consciousness that I understand? Is so, it, by it's, our it's, it's, I understand. So it's a question then. The it's a question then of understanding the word inherent, because there's an assumption in what you're suggesting that because it's beginningless, there has to be something inherent there, but that's not accurate. So let's look at it, what inherent means. And a synonym for inherent is independent. So what's happening here is I've lost lost you on my screen. Where are you? Pictures keep moving around. Oh, there you go. Okay, thanks. So then basically what the Buddha is saying is your mind, which is not physical, is a continuity of mental moments, is a result of causes, and it's impermanent. It goes second by second. It goes back and back and back. And, you, and because it's the result of cause and effect, and this is the point to think about, because it's the product of the natural law of cause and effect, meaning that if this moment of Kevin's mind exists, it implies it is the result of a previous moment of Kevin's mind. Can you accept that as a starting yes. point? So that previous moment, where did it come from, Only can only come from a previous moment. And then in that sense, you literally cannot find a first moment. So because cause and effect is an example of dependent arising and dependent arising is the best logic to prove there's no independent nature, there's no independent I, then it's immediately clear that something can be beginningless but still be impermanent and still be dependent arising and still not be, in, and not be inherent, not be independent. So something that doesn't have a cause would be something that's independent and Buddha says nothing can be like that. So inherent means independent. So there's different levels of dependence. And the level we're discussing here is causes. So something's that's why the Buddhist view would be that even the universe itself, the physical world itself, is also beginningless. Because 
you know, I mean, the Christians have a huge emphasis on the teaching called that there is a first cause, that there can logically be a first cause. It's their major teaching because it's all about God being the first cause. Buddha says it's literally not viable. So in that sense, like the universe is holding this one time kind of, you know, paraphrasing his talks with all the scientists. Big bang, he said, no problem, just not the first big bang. We're always you see, in, we're always looking for a first cause. We always want a first cause. And Buddha would say that's a mistake in itself. It's a complete misconception. So in, inherent means set in stone, uncaused, unchanging. That's what it means. So inherent, independent, these are words that are synonymous. So then an, an independent anything can't exist. Independent of causes, for example, in like terms of the mind. Are we communicating, Kevin? <clears throat> yes, that's uh, okay, actually good. extraordinarily helpful and clear. Okay, good. And clear. Uh, Thank you. Okay, fantastic. What other people? Yeah, questions, everyone? Gregory, did you have a question? Who has a question? So, Bob? Yes. Gregory, uh, okay, talk to me. Mike. Okay, talk. <sighs> Uh-huh. Gregory. Uh, is my microphone work? Uh, I can yes. hear you. Yes. Okay. You. Okay. It's not showing up. All right. So does the idea of the universe being beginningless, is that synonymous with the sort of big bounce theory that the universe came into existence through the death of a previous universe, which Who's goes view back is that? at it? Whose view is that? I don't know it's which it's a new it's a new ish scientific theory that the universe. Oh, I would totally think was, that's totally what Buddha's saying. Absolutely, yeah. So one universe dies, and then another takes its place out of the you ashes. Could, you could, I mean, roughly speaking, you'd say it like that, yeah. But it's more of an evolutionary process, you know. Yeah, and it's all coming down to what minds do. Yeah, absolutely. Would Buddha would say that? But universes are beginningless because minds are beginningless, and minds do actions which are what create universes. This is a bit abstract, but I can, we can discuss this, you know. So especially in the Vajrayana model of the universe, we've got, they talk about, we've got gross consciousness, and then that's inextricably linked to our gross body, which is this bag of bones we've got. Then we've got subtle consciousness, which is our mental states. And then, you know, in this system, they talk about, what's that weird noise, Bob? Can you hear a weird noise? It's okay. Never mind. So we've got this subtler level of our mental states, all our mental states, and they're inextricably linked to these different wind energies coursing through this system of 72,000 subtle channels. So as Lama Zopa puts it, um, and then you've got very subtle consciousness, inextricably linked with a very subtle level of physical wind energy. But as Lama Zopa puts it, Every second, you know, every second we think or do or say, think or even just think something, that first of all, okay, so let's just say you have a moment of anger. That anger coursing is inextricably linked to its own particular wind energy in your subtle nervous system. It's your subtle body, basically. So everything, even that you think, even a moment of anger, one thing it does is program your mind with the habit to be angry. That's the view of karma. So it keeps going. You grow that habit. But at the same time, that anger being inextricably linked to this wind energy pollutes that wind energy. And then eventually the habit of anger polluting more and more the wind energy, that then becomes functions, it manifests at eventually at a grosser level of being your gross body. And so that would be the cause of your physical suffering. So a moment of physical suffering is the result of states of mind, not to mention anger, that pollute the wind energies, which is your more subtle physical, and that manifests at the grosser level in the future as a gross physical experience of ill health. And then even more long term, eventually, that, that tendency to be angry manifests impacts upon the external elements, which causes the imbalance of the external elements, which is what's called suffering. So the, basically, the entire universe, all universes, are the fruit of what minds do. Oh, you, you communicating with me here, Gregory? Yes, I understand. 
Okay. So then you uh, so when, and we're talking eons of lifetimes here, you know. So there's it's not a, not just accidental, not coming from a creator, not causeless, but all universes, all experiences of individual beings. And I mean we're including here not just this human planet, but we're talking about the other realms of existence that Buddhism describes, you know, for example, a hell realm or a spirit realm, disembodied for us disembodied, but they're the experiences of the actions of those beings. And the key to understanding this model is understanding how the physical world is made of the four elements and the in intimate relationship each mind has with its own set of the four elements. How, do you understand me, Gregory? Yes. Okay. Um, and I have another question. Yeah. So if we learn that causes are empty, can we just apply this logic to that the causes of suffering are empty and therefore suffering as a whole is empty? No, it's co correct logic, but the way you're saying it you're assuming, therefore, it doesn't exist or therefore it doesn't matter. So it's a nihilistic conclusion you're coming to. Your statement's correct, but there's an implication of a nihilistic conclusion, which is incorrect. Because, in fact, suffering being empty means it exists. So emptiness, and we're going to get more into that maybe next week, about how emptiness doesn't contradict existence. And existence isn't contradicted by emptiness, which is one of the commonest misconceptions that we fall into. We'll go into that in more detail. Yeah? Okay. Okay, Gregory? Yes. yes. Okay, good. We'll go into this more detail later. Anybody else, please? Questions? Anything at all? Yes, I have a question, Robina. Yeah, good. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Um, There's a dog talking uh, as well. Our chickens, roosters, everything. Okay, go on. I'm on the rice, I'm on the rice paddy, so it's always noisy. So I hope okay. it's not. So who's who's talking? Oh, who's talking? Pass. Who is it talking? Pass. Who, who, I, I can see you on your on fishes on if, on fishes website picture. Oh yes, I could be. She sent me the link. Oh, there you go, darling. Anyway, so talk to me. Who's who is? Is that a dog with you? That's a dog, is it? Ah, uh, no, you must be. Well, I have my dog here, but I think you're looking at the wrong picture. I'm looking at you. Anyway, never mind. So talk to me, darling. Talk to me. Okay. Um. Now, about two two fellows ago, his question was in regards to the in uh, well your response was about the inherent i yeah and uh, the mind and how the mind isn't a fixed set uh state of mind you know our mind is also um in constant state of change i guess as, right as exactly the, really second one, really second. yes so it was uh, an absolutely brilliant question thank you and a really concise answer because i've always so what are, what do they actually mean by inherent? You know, I haven't quite been able to grip that. No, so exactly. I'm just wondering how the aggregates fit into that or if they do fit into okay, that. Okay, so you think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a particular, it's a teaching of the Buddhas where he presents a person, for example, in terms of five components. It's just a teaching he gives and he's dividing a person into five components. So one way of dividing very simply is into two, body and mind. But he breaks it down a bit more and he mentions a couple of more states of mind that play a massive role in our suffering called, discrimi be called, called discrimination and feeling. They're two different states of mind that play a major role. He gives them kind of special status. So it's just a particular way that Buddha breaks down the components of a person into five five little heaps of five things you know that's all that's all does that make sense because i i yes i i um i am a bit confused about the aggregates because i i've kind of grasped on to this uh understanding of it that say the, the aggregate of sight is one of them isn't it what's it called the aggregate of what sight no, no it's not one of the aggregates no that's one of the five senses. The five senses yeah. of consciousnesses, they're pretty clear. Eye, ear, nose, touch, and uh, taste. There are five sensory consciousnesses. The five aggregates is another category of things. 
Okay, I'll do some study on it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Go on. With the five senses, yeah. are, are they um, also something that we bring with us through uh, various existences? The, okay, okay. Okay, so listen, so basically, no, we, does everybody hear that crunchy sound that I'm hearing all the time? Yeah, do we know what it is? Can we stop it? No. It doesn't matter. We have to put up with it. it. Doesn't matter. Do we know what it is? Because there's no there's no speaking. There's no person open. Never mind. We'll put up with it. It's okay. So okay. So basically, darling, we've got a mind. Okay, and it's, it's the job of a mind is to cognize things. So at its subtlest level, when the mind is completely purified, then your mind is just pure, subtle capacity for cognition it's not limited by anything when you're a buddha finally your mind is not limited it cognizes that which exists it pervades wherever there is existence it's pure and clear and subtle and totally is full of wisdom there's no delusions left so now that's mind when it's fully developed but that's not like what we are so here we are in a fairly gross existence with a very gross body and that body as we know consists of these five senses i mean we have so basically we have sensory consciousness eye consciousness is the part of our mind that functions through the medium of the eyeballs etc cetera, etc cetera. ear consciousness is that part of our mind that functions through the medium of the ears the nerves and all the bits and pieces so we have a very gross body which is the vehicle, if you like, for the five sensory consciousnesses. The word consciousness and mind are generally speaking synonymous. Then we have mental consciousness, which is all our thoughts and feelings and emotions and unconscious and subconscious. So this, so this is where the workshop is. That's what we have to learn to become familiar with. That's where all our viewpoints are and all our misconceptions and all our nonsense. So we have to learn to really get in touch with our mental consciousness, all our thoughts and feelings and emotions and identify the delusions and get rid of them and grow the virtues. Do you understand? Yeah? Yes, I do. So the sense yes, of consciousness, is, 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 it's, a, it's a problem because we... We, we make, as Lama Yeshi puts it, we make the body the boss, you know. We, I mean, we are dominated, are we not, every day by our sensory experiences. If you have even the slightest pain in your knee, your whole life is completely overwhelmed by it. And we call it being unhappy. So our bodies are so dominant. All our experiences of our senses are so dominant. And what's really powerful, I like to use this discussion, you listen to this, I mean, we can see how we're misled tremendously by our sensory experiences. So, for example, you know, I always use a simple example. You know, I might say, I'll say that is a very nice mala. So, you know, it's this nice little mala here. So, naturally, when I say that statement, we will all assume that my eye consciousness is seeing a very nicely designed, a very pretty mala. You with me here? You with me here? But the fact of the matter is the sensory consciousnesses are like dumb animals. They are profoundly limited in their capacity for cognition. And eye consciousness can only cognize two things, shape and color. Ear consciousness, I'll go, wow, listen to that amazing Miles Davis as soon as I hear that one note of the trumpet. But my ear consciousness is only capable of cognizing mere sound. So, I mean, but we, we so then you've got to ask the question, well, if my eye consciousness is not cognizing a pretty mala, which part of my mind is cognizing that? Well, that's your mental consciousness. But it all happens so spontaneously. And because the sensory consciousness are, are, are for us the entry into the universe, we give them incredible power. And because so we think something looks ugly, something, but it's just made up by our mental consciousness. So what's happening is the millisecond my eyes land on that mala, 
instantaneously, and I mean it quicker than Google, my mental consciousness is accessed. And that's where all your memories are, all your viewpoints, all your opinions, all your politics, all your rubbish, all your goodness. It's all there. And as Lama Zobra says, that's where the workshop is. So in a millionth of a millisecond, I believe me, quicker than Google, the second my eyes land on that shape and color, whatever I've programmed in my mind will then say there is a pretty mala. So we believe whatever our senses tell us, but it's a lie. It's a misconception. I mean, this is really quite humbling. So we hear a sound and because it's a sound that our attachment doesn't like, we will then say it's an ugly sound and then we'll get unhappy because we, and then we believe whatever we're thinking. We believe all these stories and we're just, and we see all the universe we meet the universe through our senses and then we make up all this nonsense in our mental consciousness and believe that that's what reality is. I mean, it's so clear we are deluded, you understand. So it's very powerful to see the, the function of the sense. When we really understand this, then we can begin to practice because, you know, when you stub your toe, there's something as small as stubbing your toe. That's your sensory consciousness experiencing pain, Right. But the next millisecond, you get angry. And then you'll say, well, of course I'm angry. I stub my toe. But anger is a mental state that is an interpretation of that sensory feeling. So this is where we can learn to change the way we interpret the world because it's not from its own side, you know, bad. We just call it that. This mala does not exist from its own side as pretty. It's just my opinion. So we live in these opinions by, you know, as a result of our sensory experiences and we just don't question. This is very profound. Do you understand? Yes, thank you, Rubina. Good job. What else, people? Well, Rubina, yes. I had, had yes. um Yeah. Thinking about karma being deeply hidden, but if yeah. we don't want to take thing take it as a belief, yeah, uh, we we so it, well, so do we think of it as just a working hypothesis? That's exactly say, right, See, Bob. I find I I use that term all the time, and it can sound very grand, but it's very literally the right approach. I mean, if you're studying, if you've gone and listened to Einstein for the first time, you get all excited and want to learn about relativity. You know perfectly well it is impossible to understand it first. You've got to start at the beginning and learn that one plus one is two. So what do you do with relativity that's why you would check on einstein you'd check that it's a valid system that other people have checked on it other people have proven it which gives you confidence so then you engage in it in order to eventually realize the truth of relativity so you're taking it as your working hypothesis and every step of the way as you tick the boxes learning math and learning algebra this is moving you towards that realization so of course you have to take it as your working hypothesis that's exactly what we talk about in science so it's exactly the same here do you understand thank you we can be lazy and just believe in it because we sort of can be lazy so it's important we that's why we have to analyze it and think about it and apply it and use it in a dynamic way every day reaffirming it to ourselves as you study more math you reaffirm each point you get more confident as you move forward it's a very engaging dynamic process using it as part of your practice do you understand and the other important point here, Bob, which is the same point, but I want to spell it out. I think it's really accurate to say that any body of knowledge, and I don't just, and our trouble is we think spiritual teachings aren't about body of knowledge. They're just kind of these random, hippie trippy ideas you can't prove. But any body of knowledge, whether it's Buddhism or acupuncture or math, if it is valid, it's got to be first coherent theoretically so that don't discount theoretical certainty in fact when they always talk about in the teachings we or we go from we in order to finally gain wisdom the the the, the direct realization of the reality of something you you start with wrong view you start with not knowing i mean so let's i hear about acupuncture and i go don't be so ridiculous it's a load of rubbish i've never heard of such nonsense you know so you're starting with wrong view so then you start to look into acupuncture 
And then you start to doubt. And now the next step you get to is wrong view, tending towards, no, no uh, tending towards, um, oh no, doubt, doubt tending towards the wrong view. So you start to study it a bit and you're a little bit shaking your view and you go, maybe it's true. And they go, oh, no, 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 not possible. And then you keep studying and you gradually have doubt tending towards the right view because you're starting to get more logic. And then eventually you get what they call correct belief which is pretty tasty, then with more work, more analysis, you're going to have inferential certainty. So that means you could pass an exam in, in acupuncture theory because it's coherent. It's coherent theoretically. And you could even, even teach someone else the theory. We understand this is true. And then eventually you have direct experience. You know, that's exactly how we go here. This this is the, the process, an organic in, get in process that you're I'm engaging in. Every time you think about karma, every time you think about impermanence, every time you think about compassion, every time you think about emptiness, each one helps you understand the other one and you join the dots and it becomes a more and more coherent presentation. Theoretically, Bob, and that's already fantastic. You understand my point? Good. Thank you so much. What else, people? Any questions at all? No, nothing. There's one more. Um, Good. Go on. Somebody has to give it to me, actually. Oh, yeah. uh, somebody without a microphone. Uh, yes. Okay, Is there a question? Oh, could you down? elaborate? The question was, would you elaborate on ego validation? I don't know. I wish I knew what that, I can only assume ego validation. I don't quite, I think I need to know a little bit more before, because I might misinterpret. I need to know what that person means by that, please. If you could write down what you mean by that, I'd be very, it'd be very helpful. Because I don't quite understand. Meanwhile, is there another question? Okay, so then question. Uh, yes, go, darling. Yes, Maria. Yes, I was um I was gonna ask you, um, do you have any suggestions about how to redirect anger? Because I I find myself getting angry a lot. I understand, Maria. I understand. Join the universe, darling. Is I know, me? right? I understand. <laughs> I think you see with all of these things, I think it's important. Um, to have an analysis of what anger is. I think I find it incredibly helpful. I mean, we just sort of assume we all know what anger means, you know, but I think, and that's, we all do, we're familiar with it, but it's good to analyze what it is. Let's analyze it. I, I find this very helpful. So we look at, as you know very well, we look at Buddha's view and he talks about the three poisons, right? You've heard this a thousand times. So you've got ignorant, the root delusion, the root affliction, the root neurosis, the root misconception that is the one that's the cause of all the problems, which is known as ego grasping. This is a colloquial term. This prime is belief the deep in the depth of our bones in a definite, solid, independent me. That's the root problem. That, and such that when we realize emptiness by understanding dependent arising, we've cut that at the root. So that's the root delusion. So now the two main consequences of that, these are the ones that play out a thousand times a day in our daily life. So the, the, the next one, and this is the main voice of ego grasping, and it's called attachment. So, I mean, this is a common word. We all know it, but it's, Buddha's analysis of it is incredibly sophisticated. Lama Yeti said at one time, I could tell you about it for one whole year. We'll never begin to understand it. We've got to start simple. But basically attachment is, it starts off with it being incredible dissatisfaction. I am not enough. I don't have enough. Whatever I get, it's never enough. How much you tell me you love me, it's never enough. Nothing is ever enough. And that's the deepest pain of attachment and it's just primordially deep in us, spontaneous. No one teaches us. So then as a result of being dissatisfied, we obviously have this emotional hunger that hankers after something because if we're not satisfied, it assumes something's missing. So the obvious level of attachment in our daily lives is the objects of the five senses. So if you're feeling like you're missing something, then you go, oh, chocolate cake. Then you get all excited, you home in, you find the cake, and then attachment's next job is to exaggerate 
exaggerate the deliciousness of the cake and to exaggerate the role of the cake to make you happy and make your dissatisfaction go away. So all this is just programmed deep inside us and we get all excited, all the anticipation, waiting for the cake, and then you get the cake, but then the second you have your first mouthful, attachment, you know, the dissatisfaction is still not satisfied. So then before you know it, you want to vomit. And so we keep going. So this is the obvious grosser level of attachment. But a, a more primordial way of talking about attachment is it's this constant in, kind of almost and frantic emotional hunger to get what I want every second. I mean, it's automatic, Maria. It's just deep in our bones beyond articulate. It's this emotional, it's an assumption so there you are in your day and you're driving the car or walking and thing or doing the kitchen or doing this or going here. There's this, there's this total assumption that somehow everything that happens should be what you want. That's what attachment's thinking. So, of course, you're going to meet it a thousand times a day and it won't get what it wants. You'll stub your toe. Your hubby slurps his coffee. The kids don't do what you want. The red light is red instead of green. A thousand times a day, Maria, little baby events arise in our life that are exactly what attachment doesn't want. And guess what? That's called anger, baby. Yeah. Anger is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. It's kind of so obvious, you know. So, of course, if we have no control over our mind, then then we certainly have no control our, over our body and our speech, so it all vomits out the mouth, you know. And our tragedy is, as we all know, in our culture, we don't learn techniques to pay attention to the mind and to focus. But when we start to do that, at least we can begin not to control your anger, Maria, but to control the speech. Because we all know that's where the trouble comes. You know, and most of us might go around killing and stealing from too many people, but it's the speech, Maria. In our families, everything blurts out our mouth. So this is why it's so interesting. The very first level of practice is not telling us to control our anger. It's, it's as Lama Zobra puts it, we should learn to control the servants of our anger and our attachment, which is our body and speech. Zip your lip and keep your hands to yourself. That's why the very first level of practice is living in vows, having a discipline, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, at least control your behavior. And this is tremendously powerful practice, but we just don't pay attention to it. So, you know, that then because you've got more control over your speech, you can now begin to work on the anger itself. But if the anger just vomits out the mouth, it's, the deed is done. It's just too late. You know, we so we've got to start paying attention and having a decision to control the speech. Just don't say the words. And it takes time, but it's possible. And then there's more space to see the mind, darling. Mm -hmm. So yeah, really I, the, answer, the answer is to make a firm decision. If you do your four opponent powers, your purification practice at the end of the day, you make a firm decision. Tomorrow I'm going to watch my speech like a hawk. Don't worry about the anger. That's in the mind. Mm -hmm. But the speech, we can learn to control that first. It's a miraculous practice if we can really take it seriously. And then 90% of the damage is then not done. So they have a saying that when you're with others, you control your behavior. When you're on your own, you can really then start to work on your mind. It's very logical. But in our culture, we're so used to just thinking, well, I can say what I like. I can do what I like. We just sounds kind of boring. But it's quite profound thinking it like this. You understand, Maria? Yes. Thank Good. you. Good, darling. Wonderful. Thank you. So go on. Did somebody say about that question about validating ego Do they have any more points um it, not enough to really know she said you you said something about that term a few months ago and that it was related to self and i oh okay well let me just see okay um uh, well maybe i don't know if this is what you're saying but i'll say this Part, one of our deepest attachments first of all the attachment to all the, the extensory objects is pretty clear food and music and all the business. Then the more primordial one of wanting what I want every second. But another primordial way that attachment works is um, wanting, is attached to somebody liking me, attachment to approval. 
attachment to being validated by others. This is a major source of our pain. And this is what we mean by low self-esteem, meaning attachment when it's really strong. It's the symptom of a person who doesn't think that they have any value until someone else likes them. So if we've got this really strongly, we want to be validated by others. So we sort of, we will adjust our behavior to make sure that what I just said is approved of by the person in front of me. And then I think, oh, I must've done the right thing. So we don't have any authenticity this way and we need validation from other people. This is a disaster. This is a nightmare. This is so painful because in the end, we don't even know what we want. We don't even know what we think. We don't really know what to think. We're too scared to make a decision in case someone doesn't like us. We judge ourselves based on what other people think of us. I mean, it's a terrible cause of suffering. So if that's what you're talking about, that's very much one of the most deep attachments, you know. I hope that was the point, perhaps. Yes, Alexandra. Hi, Renival. How are you? <laughs> okay, good, darling. Um, I just had a more every day to day question. Um, good. <clears throat> I start my day every day just doing my practices, and I feel very happy, very light. But then I work on a family, I work on a courthouse with family law, and it's a lot of stress. It's very dense, mm -hmm. so I start my day very light, and then I find myself at the end of the day just being like, just being just the stress taking over. I work with the judge, course, I work no. with attorneys. Of course, we judge. So my question is, um, any suggestions as to like how to grip that mind? Yeah, I understand. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, first of all, it's inappropriate to really think that you can have the same feeling being in crazy traffic, not to mention crazy work situation at the same, the same way you feel when you're quiet on your own. In the beginning, we're quite fragile. So it's good to start the day, but then as we progress, darling, as we progress, Alexandra, we, the more we learn to control, know, be in touch with our mind second by second by second, we won't get pulled by all the external circumstances and we can stay steady. That comes eventually. So my feeling is you're doing all the right things. You just have to keep practicing and you be, and make a strong decision to be noticing what's going on in your mind second by second, especially when things start getting stressful, you know, that's mm -hmm. just, the it's sort of like any skill. If you've never driven a car on the freeway, you'll, you'll go crazy first day, but as you get better at driving, you just get more skillful at, in, you know, at dealing with all the dramas. You don't lose the plot. It's exactly the same here, Alexandra. So have confidence in the process, darling, and be first be conscious about your speech really like I was saying before to, to Maria, but also becoming, as things are happening, keep yourself steady in your own mind and don't get dragged by, learning not to be dragged by the external circumstances. It is absolutely possible, but you just have to keep going, knowing it's possible and you get better and better. It's not magic. It's hard work, but it's possible, sweetheart. But so Thank keep you. doing your practice though. If you give up your practice, you're lost. <laughs> Thank you. You understand? Yeah. Keep moving, darling. What else, people? Any other questions? Well, why don't we just kind of go straight? I mean, let's just go into more discussion now about dependent arising then. I mean, we've got next week as well, whichever week it is we're talking, maybe a couple of weeks, I don't remember. But let's go into more detail about that now, you know. So the um one of the key ways that John Carper talks about <laughs> Yeah, is this one of dependent arising being the king of logics to prove emptiness? So the framework here then is what they refer to as the two truths. There's different ways of analyzing the two truths, but here it's referring to the universe consists of millions upon millions of things, right? This is learning to know the conventional truth. That, like there's a cup and a toilet and a map and a dog and a person and a piece of paper. There are trillions of phenomena that we all have in our world. And I always joke and say since Steve Jobs invented the iPhone, we probably doubled the number of phenomena on the planet. Look at all the apps alone, you know. So we keep we can see that these are conventional truths. The con so already you can argue, like I've saying before, that we're not even touched with conventional truth. We think we've got a creator. We think the mind is the brain. We think we don't play any role in our own happiness. We're living in la-la land even conventionally. 
So you could argue the entire Lam Rim is Buddha's presentation of at least what is conventionally true. And if we can get in touch with just conventional reality, we'll be happy as Larry, I tell you. But so the conventional reality is the way all things exist. Then all those conventional phenomena all have this ultimate reality of lacking an intrinsic nature. So the shorthand for the first of these two is conventional truth. And the shorthand for the second one is ultimate truth. Finally. So these two, initially, we completely hear them as separate, you know. We've got the two wrong views right now. So when we say conventional, we mean, you know, and then we see ultimate, we see them as completely opposite. But why Tsongkhapa, he wrote this wonderful praise of Buddha for his teachings on dependent arising, because this is the most powerful way to help us understand emptiness, because at the same time, it's helping us understand conventional reality as well. And these two totally come together. So, okay. The Buddha is saying, like I said before, we are in la-la land in relation to how things exist, both conventionally and ultimately. But here now, let's look at the ultimate. Because he's saying the main, the main mistake we make, the main delusion, the root delusion, the root misconception, the root affliction is known literally as ignorance, ma-rigpa unawareness. There's levels of this, but the one we're discussing here is the, the ultimate one. This primordial mistake deep in the bones of our being, so deep that we, it's, I mean, talk about assumption, you know, attachment is an assumption for us. Anger is an assumption because they're so programmed, but this is an ab, at the level of total assumption, so subtle, we don't even notice it, which is why it's hard to hear the words about it because we don't recognize it. We can begin to recognize attachment and aversion, but this one is really hard to recognize. So the root delusion, ignorance that believes, causes us, if you like, to believe absolutely with certainty that the I, and indeed everything else that exists, has this intrinsic nature, this absolute nature, this independent nature, this inherent nature. There's all these synonyms that we all utterly believe from the depths of our being, this ignorance, that everything exists inherently. Everything exists um, uh, from its own side. Everything exists in and of itself. Everything has a, an intrinsic nature. Everything is self-existent. There's many, many, many synonyms, all ways of saying the same thing. Okay, and Buddha's saying, sorry, guys, you're up a creek without a paddle. Things don't exist like that. So we have to prove it. He's not says just to believe it, you know. So, um, okay. So then first of all, if we are mistaken about the nature of something, ultimately, then we first got to establish what it is conventionally first. So, you know, let's use this example. I will say, mummy, what's that? my funny screen. She will say, well, sweetheart, that's called a thermos. So that's the name for this. We have to label it accurately. We label it. And then she has to give me a definition. Our trouble is we will believe anything anyone ever tells us. I mean, look at the insanity on websites and everything. People believe in any theory, the conspiracy theories. People are living in complete insanity because whatever we hear, we just believe it. You know, we're completely insane. So your mother should tell you, and I say, okay, thank you, mummy. It's a thermos. Now, please give me a definition. In other words, what is that conventionally? Well, then she will say, you know, a definition has two parts. She will, can you see it's this flat bottomed metal container? So I can see that it's a flat bottomed metal container. That tells you the first part of the definition. But that's not the main thing yet. I have to, this is a really powerful point. I have to know the second part, which is what is it in its bones? Meaning what does it do? Meaning what is its function? Meaning what is its meaning? Everything that exists, you have to point to it, label it, define it, and then she has to prove it is that. 
So what does she do? She gets her tea. She comes along. She pours it in. She puts on the lid. You come back. Oh, she'll tell you, sorry, that it's a flat bottom metal container. And then she will tell you its meaning, its nature, its function. It keeps my tea warm. So you don't believe her. She has to prove it. So she gets her tea. She pours it in. She puts on the lid. She comes back in two hours. She takes off the lid and the tea is still warm. She has just proved that it is that. But even still don't be satisfied. You then have to check in the conventional world that you know that there's no other phenomena that fits that definition. So once you've established this, you tick the boxes, you shake hands, and now we know the meaning conventionally of a thermos. Now, as like I said before, if we could get conventional reality clear, we'd all be happy as Larry. We just believe in even conventional things that don't exist. We're living in la-la land and we don't check anything that anyone tells us. We just believe whatever we're told. We're all completely crazy. So this is already pretty powerful, establishing what exists conventionally. And the onus is on us to check it out. This is a huge thing. So now, now we have to go to the ultimate side and now literally discover how this thing exists ultimately. So what Buddha is saying is we might know conventionally that it is a flat-bottomed metal container that keeps your tea warm and we know it's true, but we are putting this lie on top of it. Ultimately, we believe it, it is intrinsically a metal container that keeps your tea warm. So what Buddha is essentially saying is we have to investigate. And then what we will do is then discover that from the side of this thermos, as Lama Zopa puts it, finally, we will discover there's not one atom of an intrinsic, independent, flat-bottomed metal container that keeps my tea warm, that is completely empty of existing in and of itself, completely e empty of existing from its own side, completely empty of existing finally, independently of the mind that calls it that. So we establish it first conventionally, then we have to establish its emptiness ultimately. So, okay, let's use the example of the phenomenon called I. So there are three levels at which Buddha describes, and Tsongkhapa uses this, three levels at which things exist conventionally. Sorry, dependent arising. Dependent arising is the shorthand for conventional reality. Emptiness is the shorthand for ultimate reality. Okay? So the very first level of dependent arising of I is cause and effect, like I said before. Cause and effect, which is karma. It's Karma is a brilliant example of the law of cause and effect, which is the, 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 the first level of dependent arising, the grossest level, that I am the result of countless causes in my own mind, going back and back and back, as well as external causes like parents and things. So karma is a great example of dependent arising at the first level, which is that I is the product of causes. And what even that will do, as I said earlier, is loosen the grip of the self-pity I that doesn't think I play any role at all. I'm this external thing that someone else created to whom good things and bad things happen unfairly. These weird ideas we have. So the first level of dependent arising is I am the product of causes. Now, the second level of dependent arising, and these are arguments that Buddha has with the prevailing views at the time. The second one is this belief very strongly that there is in here somewhere, as my friend Pende says, walking hand in hand with all the other bits and pieces, there is a very special piece in here, a very special part that is called I. So this second level of dependent arising is that I exist 
in dependence upon all these thousands of parts. So we can see that a thermos is made of various parts. A mala is made of parts. The Buddha says everything that exists, even a moment of anger, is dependent, exists dependent upon its parts. And among those parts, you will not find any I. You will not find any anger. You will not find any thermos. Because I is the name we give to those parts. And that leads us to the third level of dependent arising, which is that there is no I existing here apart from. There's no I existing here that's separate from the mind that calls it I. And you finally realize that it's merely labeled I, merely labeled anger, merely labeled thermos. So let's look at the parts one. In the Lam Rim, Tsongkhapa gets us to do this. You know, this is the four-point analysis. And we have to, you know, he says there are two main mistakes. We either totally believe that there is a piece in here separate from all the other parts that is the owner of all the other parts, like a special boss part with a capital letter I, you know. And it kind of runs the show. We really feel that one, don't we? I do this. I am the this. I make this happen. I this. I that. Like there's a, we say that word and we believe it refers to something in here. The other mistake we make is we think the whole of this is I. And we have to use logical arguments to disprove both of those. So let's look at the first one, okay? This sense that there is a piece in here along with my nose and ear and eyes and teeth and love and anger and jealousy, all the thousands of bits and pieces that make up an eye, we really feel there's a very, very special piece that is the boss and it's called I. And Buddha says, don't be ridiculous, babe. Not only isn't there one, you don't need one. This sounds very shocking to us. So let's look at this one. One of the meditations that they give us to do is we Buddha says, I'm you know, he's telling us already there isn't a separate eye. There isn't an independent eye, a piece that's independent of the other parts. There isn't. He's telling us that, but it's no good just to hear him. He says we have to prove it to ourselves, okay? And that's what the meditation is. So this is intense. So one of the analyses we can do, they suggest you do, you know, you, here you are, you're, there's me, there's this package. You have to start doing an analysis. Well, where is the I in here? You know, you start to search, is it this? Is, is it that? Is it this? Is it there? And you start, and even one meditation you can do is you can gradually de in your mind in meditation, deconstruct this entire package and put all the pieces out there, you know, and because if there is a piece called I, you will definitely find it. But there's a reverse way to do that analysis, and I like that. And that's the IKEA example, okay? So you look up on, on the IKEA website and you'll see a very nice eye, you know, a nice bob. Oh, I'm going to buy one of them. And you go to the bloody IKEA and it's a big shock. You get a box, don't you, with millions of parts in it. So you've got to make your own damn bob, you know? It's a good example. It's the opposite. You don't break apart the eye. The eye is already breaking apart. So what? So the thing is, you know, it sounds silly, but you listen. We we have, you know, you start constructing that eye. You put all that. So we know in advance that IKEA has already built the eye and they know exactly how many bits are needed. And this is a really powerful point. If you see, back like I said before about the thermos, discovering what a thermos is, if something does exist conventionally, you have to label it, you have to define it, it has to have a function and you have to prove it. If we could do just that with the entire world, we'd be in touch with conventional reality. So now the same with the pieces of eye. If the IKEA knows you need one nose, two ears, 
24 teeth, and they put each piece in. So already we can assume that each piece, and this is the point, has a function. They don't put four and a half legs in, you know, they don't put up for a table, you get exactly the number of screws, exactly the right everything. And each of those pieces, you, you check this, plays a role and you end up making the table and there'll be nothing left over because each piece in there has its function. So every piece that makes up a person, it's the same. It has a function. You've got a nose and the eyes and the eyelashes and the hair and the ears and the nerves and the pee, -pee and the caca and the anger and the love, all the millions of pieces. So you gradually start constructing this eye. And of course, we are waiting desperately to find this very special piece that we assume has to exist because there wouldn't be an eye if it didn't, which is a special piece that's labelled eye in special gold writing on its own little Ziploc bag with shiny light around it. We believe there is a piece that is not the breast and is not the nose and is not the ear and is not the teeth that is the eye that is the boss. That's how we feel. You see how you feel when someone insults you. I, you say, did not do that, you know. Now, you don't mean your nose didn't. You don't mean your ear didn't. You don't mean your teeth didn't. This special piece you believe is in there and that we have believed in since beginningless time. But we've never analysed it. So there's an argument, a debate. They say if something exists, it has to be one thing or more than one. And it seems a bit abstract initially, but let's do that analysis. So I will say to you, I have I have a phone and a mala. Now you heard that statement and you heard that I said three things. I, there's one. Phone, there's two. Mala, there is three. I said that statement. So you have to prove that I just spoke the truth. And that's pretty easy. You know what a mala looks like. You know what, in this case, this eye looks like. And you know what the phone looks like. So then how many phenomena did I just state? It's very clear. Three. And that means in this case, it's quite simple. They are both independent of each other insofar as they don't rely upon each other for their existence and they can and they're separate from each other it's a very straightforward example so you can point out the eye that isn't the mala and isn't the phone you can point out the phone that isn't the eye and isn't the mala and you can point out the mala that is not the phone is not the eye so you've proven there are three separate independent phenomena that's truth I will make another statement. I have a nose and an ear. So there are three phenomena I mentioned. I, nose, ear. Now, if that's true, we have to point out, just like before, three separate independent phenomena. Well, we can do that. There's the ear. There's a nose. They don't exist. They don't depend upon each other to do their job. Ear listens. It doesn't need a nose to do that. The nose can be cut off. The nose breathes. It doesn't need an ear to do that. So in a simple sense, they are independent and separate. Now, what about the third phenomenon called I that doesn't exist in dependence upon an ear and nose? Kaka, pee, pee teeth, and all the other millions of pieces. Because if there were a piece called I in here somewhere, which we believe, if there were a piece called I that isn't, let's say, the nose, isn't the ear, isn't the teeth, means it's an independent thing, if there were a piece called I, then when 
when Maria insults my nose and says, oh, your nose is so ugly, Rabina. And I'll say, how dare you insult me? And she will say accurately, no, Rabina, I didn't insult you, your eye. I insulted your nose. And then if there were this independent eye in there, it would be kind of sighing with relief. Oh, phew, I'm glad Maria didn't insult me. Poor old nose got insulted, but I'm okay. I mean, this is like a joke for us, but if there were an independent eye that doesn't exist in dependence upon the nose and the ear and the caca and the pee-pee, then, then that would be the consequence. But that's not how we feel, is it? Because, you see, that's the other mistake. We believe that the I is all of me. So we either have the mistake that the I is the owner or we believe all of me is the I. And we have to use logic to argue with both of those to prove that this is not possible. And this is the part. I mean, when you've got these two to get clear, then you realize emptiness, you know. It's incredibly subtle. But you've got to use logic. And why do you have to use logic? Because the delusions are insanely irrational. So we have to unpack and unravel them to, to with using logic to disprove these demented, demented misconceptions deep in the bones of our being, you know. So the point is, Buddha is not saying there is no I. He is saying there's no I that's independent of the parts. There's no I that's separate from the parts. There's no I even that's separate from the mind that labels it I. So once you've realized emptiness, you then realize dependent arising. So as Amazopa says, when you realize the emptiness of the eye, when you realize that from the side of the eye, there's not an atom of anything that makes it I, it's as if there's no eye. But conventionally, there is an I. But what does exist is so subtle, it's as if. It doesn't exist. So this is a way of putting the two truths. That's the yogi's view, you know, because they totally come together. So one of the mistakes we make when we hear emptiness, we hear nothingness. And when we hear dependent arising, we hear somethingness. So we exaggerate both. We over-exaggerate nothingness and we over-exaggerate somethingness. They're both extreme. They're both the extreme views. They're misconceptions, you know. Because reality is, when we realize emptiness, it tells us it exists conventionally. And when we've realized conventional reality, it tells us it is empty of existing from its own side. That emptiness not only doesn't disprove reality, it, it, it affirms reality. And reality is affirmed by being things being empty. So we've got to put these two together, you know. The Heart Sutra, Lord Buddha tells us very nicely in the Heart Sutra how these two truths come together. So let's take it from a different tack now. So let's look at the word itself, emptiness. We get really thrown by it, you know. It's just shorthand, that's all, shorthand. For, you know, like would say, I'll pick up my cup, I'll go to drink, and I'll go, oh, oh, my cup's empty, I'll say. You look in your bank account, oh, my God, my bank's empty, you know. We'll say words like that. It's very comfortable. We say like this. What we're meaning here is my cup is empty of tea. What we mean is my bank account is empty of money. It's like, it's a funny way to say it. It lacks money. Money is absent from my bank account. Tea is absent from my cup, you know. There's simple examples. So... Okay, so Buddha's saying everything that everything that you posit that you can prove, define and prove is an existent phenomenon. There's various terms, phenomenon, 
existent. There's several terms for you, what are used to refer to that which exists. Object, object of knowledge. So if we can say, if there's tea, if there's tea in my cup, then we can say that T is a phenomenon that exists because we can cognize it. The actually is very powerful. The definition of an existent, one of the terms used to refer to that which exists, is very tasty. The, the definition of something existing is that it can be cognized by mind. I mean, mind in Buddhism is so central. In the Western, the modern world, this is not valid. We don't even trust the mind. We have to prove externally something existing. The Buddha says what defines something as existing is that mind can cognize it. I mean, that's really powerful. So listen to this very simply. There are millions of phenomena that exist in the world. And if you can cognize it, that defines it as existing. So if we can look, I'll look in my cup, and I will see a liquid in there and we'll check up and we'll all agree it's T. So then we define T and then we can validate T as a conventional phenomenon. T exists. Pretty simple. Now listen to this. I look in my cup and this is an interesting point. Because I'm expecting T, I will get a shock. Because why? Because what I just discovered is the absence of T. Can you hear that concept? So absence of T, if you and I look in this cup together, we can both we can both validly say that the phenomenon that we are cognizing at this moment, which does exist, is the absence of T. Can you hear that, people? It's a very vivid, real phenomenon. If you look in the bank, and you think there's five hundred dollars in it, and you get the big shock, and you discover there's actually no dollars. So there's absence of five hundred dollars. That's a real phenomenon that does exist. It's more it's more abstract, but it's a real phenomenon that does exist in your bank. It's the absence of your precious five hundred dollars. The absence of T is a valid phenomenon that by looking I can deduce that T does not exist. So that phenomenon is called the absence of T. Well, the absence of an independent I is exactly the same. The emptiness of an independent I is what you finally recognize in the subtlety of your meditation after lifetimes of meditating on dependent arising. One day the penny will drop and you will see for the first time that there never has been, isn't, and never could be the fantasy eye that you thought was there. And then you, what you're cognizing is the absence of that fantasy eye. The absence the emptiness of it. So emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Emptiness means the absence of what you thought was there. In other words, the only person who's going to recognize the absence of tea in this cup is the person who expected tea. The only person who sees the absence of $500 in your bank is the person who expected $500 because it's an abstract phenomenon. So we have been clinging for eons to a real, independent, pointable, findable I. One day, like I said, in your subtlest meditation, the penny will drop and you'll see for the first time the absence of what you thought has been there since beginningless time. That's the realization of this very powerful, very vivid, really existing phenomenon called the absence of an independent I. Are we communicating? You see, we just hear emptiness. We hear nothingness. That's complete nihilism. It's total nonsense. It's, it's something very powerful. Because again, remember, it's so interesting. The only person who's going to notice the absence of tea in a cup is the person who expects tea in a cup. The only person who will notice the absence of $500 is the person who expected 
$500. The only person who's going to notice the absence of an independent I is the person who's been believing in an independent I, which is everybody. So it's, it's trying to show that emptiness doesn't mean you chuck out all the pieces here and you end up with nothing. Oh, well, there's no I. I might as well kill myself. Total, total mistake. Emptiness of independent I is a characteristic of the I that does exist, the, the dependent arising I. So emptiness of independent I is a characteristic that exists right there on the dependent arising I. So what Lord Buddha says in the Heart Sutra, he talks at one of the five aggregates. The first one he says, form is empty. Then he says, Emptiness is form. Then he says form is nothing other than emptiness. And then he says emptiness is nothing other than form. What he's saying is where you find, so we can have anything there. You can put form, cup, I, where you find a dependent arising I, right there you will find the characteristic called emptiness of independent I. So emptiness of independent I is a characteristic of the I that exists. And then he says in emptiness of in inherent I is, this, it is the I, the dependent arising I. So dependent arising I is emptiness of, of independent I. And then emptiness of independent I is dependent arising I. And emptiness of I is nothing other than the dependent arising I. And dependent arising I is nothing other than the emptiness. So you can't have emptiness of independent I without a bloody I in the first place. But we think it means, aha, we found an I. No. As Lama Zopa says, when you realize the emptiness of independent I, it's as if there's no I. But there is an I. But when you but when you realize what it is, it's as if there's no I. It's so subtle. So it's a really subtle point, you know. The dependent arising and, and emptiness are the flip side, really, of the same thing. So they're not separate. And they each informs the other. So instead of thinking emptiness means nothingness, emptiness means dependent arising. Dependent arising means emptiness. You can't have one without the other. Any questions? Time to go home soon. Any questions, people? Maybe we'll finish there and just contemplate it and then we'll meet next time and, con and continue the conversation. Unless there's an urgent question. Nothing there. Yes, anybody, somebody. See, I mean, you know, there's different ways of realizing emptiness. And one way, of course, as Lamieshi talks about in his book Mahamudra, is you just go straight to meditate. It's quite advanced. But there's other ways, you, you as Lamieshi puts it, you squeeze your brain. <laughs> You know, what we tend to do is mystify emptiness as if somehow inherently it's difficult to understand. No, like anything, it's just words. You just start with the words. You start with the theories. You start with the words. And slowly with familiarity, the words start to become meaningful. You know, you've got to have the right words. It's important to learn. And slowly by saying them, meditating on them, the meaning comes, you know. It's like any words, theory, you know. So I think we just... Um, Finish with that. So just think, you know, we dedicate this nearly two hours of thinking, analyzing, contemplating the meaning of, of the Buddhist view of the universe with the wish that we realize there, if there is truth here, that we realize this truth. And as if His Holiness says, if we discover it's not true, that we discover the lack of truth of it, it's up to us, you know. And then, of course, we must reject the Buddha. That's up to us. So we continue our practice, our theories, our work, and, and trying to apply it experientially, you know. If you keep it in your head, you're in big trouble. It's got to, f it's got to filter down into your experiences, you know. Then it's so powerful. And um, we just make the strong prayer that Lama Zabram Shame comes back very quickly. We create the cause to come back quickly so he can continue to teach us 
Because, you know, every word I'm telling you, I've heard from him. I've learned from Lama Yeshi and Lama Zopa, you know. Chang Chub, Sem Chog, Rinpoche, Ma Khe Panam Khe Gyu Chig, Khe Panyam Pam, Me Panyam, Gong Ne Gong Du, Phal Ba Shog. So there is not a single eye from its own side, but there is an eye that's dependent on rising. And these are the two seeming contradictions that we have to put together, integrate. So try do our best. And keep moving and never give up, okay? Thank you, dearest people. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody. So kind. And I don't know when I'm going to see you again, but I'll look up my calendar and I'm sure I'll find it. And I'll see you again and we can carry on the conversation, okay? Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so darling. much. All of you so much. So kind. Good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good night. Thank the Australians in Bali need the morning Good night. Thank you, darlings.